In the Quran, there is a passage about a group who were wandering the desert and coincidentally happened upon the angel Jaril as he was revealing the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad. One of the curious group said unto the others, Listen quietly. When the exalted moment was over, they quickly scurried off to tell their people what they had just heard. A wondrous recitation, one said to their people. Another continued, O oh, our fellows, we have truly heard a scripture revealed after Moses, confirming what came before it. It guides to the truth and to the path of righteousness. And the whole tribe then submitted to the Lord Allah and his book, the Quran, that he was the one, the only, without mate nor offspring, that they would only seek refuge in his mercy and compassion, seek help in his wisdom to maintain the straight way, and ultimately truly know that upon the coming of Judgment Day, it is their actions in this realm that will result in their admittance to heaven or banishment to hell. Listening to this story, you'd think that this was a group of local Arab Jews accidentally intruding exactly at the moment when the angel Jibreel was revealing the Qur'an to the Prophet, and then there resulted submission to the Islamic faith. You, just to be clear, would be totally wrong. These listeners weren't Arab Jews. Actually, they weren't human at all. They were jinn, Jewish jinn to be specific, ancient spiritual inhabitants of this material world, as well as that of another alternative realm. So let's start with what the jinn are. The jinn are ancient beings that God created out of a smokeless fire called Nar al-Sumum, meaning the fire of the scorching winds. They are sentient beings that are more akin to spirits, as they are virtually weightless. So weightless that they can fly to the highest of heavens. Some are known as shapeshifters and can transform their invisibility into an appearance of a human or an animal. The name jinn and its old Arabic root of the composition J N N jinn gives the notion that they themselves are hidden within a hidden world. In Islam, there are many worlds that are layered on top of each other, separated by eons of time, and within one of these worlds is the domain of the jinn, the imaginal realm, a world as metaphysically real as our world of the senses and intellect. And within this world do the jinn live. As if they are human, they live and die, procreate and have families. Some are nomadic, yet others sedentary, with cities and towns akin to those of humans. They are of many races and creed. They, as with humans, are mukellafin, meaning they have been charged by God to submit to the faith and abide by its canons. And as we heard in the story at the very beginning, there are Jewish jinn, Christian jinn, pagan jinn, and godless jinn even denominational jinn. Eventually, jinn will be judged as to how they had lived their lives, and upon such judgment, enter either heaven or hell. Jinn have their own nations and layered societies, leaders and kings, even hierarchies of power and abilities. There are several strata of jinn that reflect these variances in capabilities. Aghul, for example, is a cunning shapeshifter and one of the more powerful iterations of the jinn. The Marid is a rebellious and sinful giant jinn who attempts to discover fate by snooping around the heavens. Efrits are winged and malicious spirits of the dead. And as a final example of the hierarchy of the jinn, we have the Nisnas and the Shik, half-formed beings that are short and small, with powers of prediction that whisper misdirection and untruths to humans. Beyond such types, all other jinn are referred to simply as jinn. One common and frequent misconception about the jinn is that they are by nature innately evil. This is untrue. The jinn operate the same way as humans do. There can be those who are pious and inherently good, while at the same time, there can be those who are evil and malicious. An evil or heretical jinn is referred to as a shaitan, a demon. One interesting personal observation is when we list all the types of beings that have been created by Allah, from the dawns of creation and analyze their respective development in terms of intellect and physique, the Hin, the Bin, Tim, Rim, Jan, and the Jinn, and then onwards finally towards humanity, 
It roughly mimics the scientific progress of human evolution. Our the first human ancestors were the Dryopithecus, then the Ramapithecus, Australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, and finally Homo sapiens sapiens. From a weak intellect to one of strong will and reason. From a brute force of a body to a well-oiled physical specimen. The Jin story, though, is much more ancient than that of humans, and way earlier than that of the first humans, Adam and Eve. And that takes us to their first iteration on Earth. After Allah created the heavens and the Earth, He created the Hin, the Bin, and the Jan. They were simpler beings, with an intellect less than that of the Jin or humans. The Hin, Bin, and Jan were not charged to submit to Allah and roamed the lands as would the animals. Yet soon thereafter, Blood was spilled between these beings, and death and suffering followed. The Jan had exterminated all the Hin and the Bin. Allah commanded his angels to descend upon the earth and wipe out the Jan. Most were killed, while a few hid from the angels. One, a young Jan, who had a profound love for Allah and was penitent in every way, was spared by the angels. This was Azazel, and in sparing him, the angels brought him up with them to their dominion. Eons passed and Azazel rose in stature within the ranks of the angels, even though he himself wasn't one. And his love for Allah multiplied. Yet his love was challenged when Allah introduced his new creation, Adam, to the angels, as his ideal creation. When Allah demanded that all the angels prostrate themselves to Adam, they all obeyed, except for Azazel, who mocked the human creation and looked down upon it. Allah banished Azazel to earth, yet left him with the many powers that he had bequeathed him over time. Azazel then became Iblis, also known as Lucifer. Once Adam, Eve, and Iblis were then cast down to earth, Iblis had revenge on his mind, and his mission was to destroy all humanity. He would recruit the remnant Jan demons who had populated the earth eons earlier, and became their king. Wars between the devil and man raged on. Defeat followed defeat for Iblis, as humanity and the righteous jinn united in repelling and vanquishing Iblis's armies. Iblis then shifted his strategy from one of warmongering to one of disrupting the moral and ethical balance of humanity, to destroy their spirit and soul. Iblis uses his army of demonic jinn to whisper into the ears of humans to guide them away from the righteous path. Iblis reveals to humans how to sing, how to play music, how to dance and seduce, to seek pleasure over all else, how to lie, how to steal, and how to kill, thus leading to the first sinful acts of humanity. To get to know more about where much of the jinn's history and story are told, please check out Ibn Kathir's al bidaya wa Nahaya, The Beginning and the End, as well as Ibn Taymiyyah's essay on the jinn. Jinn and Islam are an integral part of the belief system. Human prophets sent to humans were also sent to all the jinn beings as well. The Quran mentions the jinn repeatedly and explains how they are an integral factor in the post-creation narrative. The Quran, hadiths, and respected exegesis preach how within our world there is a world of the angels, a world of the jinn and demons, a world we can't see called Alam al ghaib and a world we witness yet don't actually comprehend called the Alam al-Shahada. Islam clearly outlines how the jinn operate in a dual-dimensional sense within our tangible world, where they can manifest, as well as how they can exist in their invisible domain, that can neither be seen nor reached by humans. And with the jinn being associated with something that's hidden, they are shrouded in much mystery and speculation. Hence, the biggest question in Islam concerning jinn is whether they can cross over into humanity's physical domain and interact with humans on a real tactile level. Some scholars in the Islamic world are convinced that there indeed can be all types of relationships and cross-traffic between a manifested jinn and a human being, including the possession of a human by a jinn. Some consider this a question that humans cannot know of or understand. Many are on the side of this latter position, claiming due to the lack of clear evidence within the Quran and the Hadiths that there can't really be any bodily relations with humans, be it through possession, sexual intercourse, 
medical infection, psychiatric dominance, or even physical abuse. One of the main arguments against the cross-trafficking of humans and jinns is that humans are far superior and more powerful than the jinn. The jinn have many weak points, but the main Achilles heel for the jinn is their inferior intellect and imagination when compared to humans. And a prime example of this superiority is explained in the Quran with the story of the Prophet Sulaiman. In the story, Sulaiman, also known as King Solomon, is granted a seal ring that allows him to control the wind, the jinn, and the birds. And in having so much power, Sulaiman uses the jinn to expand his nation through the building of cities and monuments that today have defied the ages in their persistence and complexity. Yet the part of the story that reflects the lesser than ideal intellectual or imaginative capacity of the jinn is that when Sulaiman died, he did so standing in a glass cube which he had erected to view the work of the jinn as they completed their tasks. And when he died, he was leaning on his staff, consequently appearing to be fully awake. The jinn for many, many years continued their laborious servitude without question. Only when a termite ate through the staff at its narrowest did the body of Suleiman collapse onto the glass cube floor. Did then the jinn realize that they had been needlessly completing all of his instructions? This episode concluded that not only were the jinn blinded by their submission to Suleiman or by the fact that there was no real use of reason to understand and analyze what had transpired to Suleiman, but also the fact that no new instruction was given by Suleiman over that time, that they as a race weren't able to see or to know the unknown or the hidden as was mythologized previous to that. In Islam, as with the other Abrahamic religions, as well as in ancient Arabian folklore, the jinn represents temptation. That's pretty much it. The weakness comes from the human himself, in making the right or wrong choices in their lives, and allowing their moral promise to be questioned and thereupon broken by their own thoughts or actions, in abandoning Allah while seeking refuge in other beings that might appear to be more powerful. But it's a bit unfair to the jinns, the whole lot of them seem to take the brunt of this negative reputation. We had said from the very beginning that not all jinn are bad. One can't generalize and be judgmental on a group simply because a minority, or even a majority, do reflect that common sentiment. Jinn in vast quantities are pious, kind, and are benevolent towards human people. Help them be a better version of themselves, whether in faith or life come to their aid during trying times and even at moments inspire humans to transcend themselves, as would any good Samaritan human being. So we might be made out of different raw elements, us clay and them a smokeless fire, but we all struggle with the same questions of life, morality and ethics. We deal with the same trials and tribulations. So maybe the jinn are somewhat spiritually human after all.